Hi, I'm Mara Webster with In Creative Company, and today I'm thrilled to be talking about the audio series Spark Hunter. We are joined today by director and executive producer Trudy Styler, as well as actor and executive producer Mark Rylance. And Trudy, starting with you, I wanted to talk a little bit about your your foray into working into working in audio storytelling for this project, because obviously through Maven Pictures and and the rest of your work directing and producing, you're primarily usually working on narrative features. And I was interested in what skill sets from that served you really well with a lot of the parallels in terms of how you're thinking about the ways to tell a story and what were some of the new elements and new challenges that came with this project for you? Well, um, yeah, well, um, as a producer and now a director and I've been an actor uh, since I was in my 20s, we're storytellers. And so uh, the podcast uh, really is for me, um, because I'm of that age where radio broadcasts were or what I grew up with, uh, growing up in the Midlands, um, and uh, and and so uh, you only have ears and you have your imagination. And um, and I I was delighted when um, I was asked to um, to come on board as the director of uh, Spark Hunter, um, and it was really a courtesy of Mark because we'd had a terrific experience um, in. Um, just as we got to the millennium, the Dalai Lama had asked for a peace garden to be created in um, in London on the site of the Imperial War Museum. And uh, um, I being a, a great admirer um, of all that he is and all that he stands for, and uh, as was Mark. Mm. And so uh, I was asked to raise the funds and Mark was kind mm. enough to uh, loan us his theatre, The Globe, and uh, to um, then come on board and um, we did a fundraising evening in the form of many different forms of uh, of uh, scenes from plays and poetry uh, and it was a terrific success and I think our relationship uh, kicked off to a very good start by having um, a profound uh, respect for the Dalai Lama but also a great uh, love for environmentalism and what what does that really mean? What is environmentalism? And so our dialogue has gone on through uh, quite a few years. Um, and then when this uh, came along, um, I was just delighted to uh, to become the director. Amazing. And and Mark, I wanted to talk a little bit about working with Rebecca Ferguson, who voices the AI character, her, for which your character is the, the creator and the maker of her, um, because that's obviously so central to the entire series. And, and I know that often with audio projects, you don't always have the opportunity to be in the same room together recording. So I was interested for this, whether you did have that opportunity or how the two of you really worked together to figure out what's the specificity of this dynamic between, you know, a creator and an AI that he is created himself well Trudy enabled that I think she insisted on it and I would have agreed with her completely that we needed to be in the same room Rebecca and I and so wonderfully she she was able to provide a space for us to go for a week and live and work every day in in wonderful surroundings um in a very focused uh, way and and then after that process Judy uh, Trudy has also laid on all kinds of fantastic sounds and depth and quality to the recording, which I think comes also from her great ear and her producing and directing skills. Um, but what was nice, because we'd never worked together before, was um, she, she was really good at um, challenging Rebecca and I in, in the room, coming from, I guess, her acting tradition in the theater. Um, we, we, I felt we really were playing it in the room, even though there were microphones and stuff around us. But we were looking each, in each other's eyes and um, and trying to get what we needed, uh, as you would in a play. So so that, yeah, I, I think it would have been much diminished if we hadn't been in the same room and doing that together. And we yeah. set up, thank you, Mark, for saying that's very kind of you. Hmm. We, we set up um, uh, uh, our room uh, to look like the restaurant. Um, yeah, they did. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. And it was uh, it was a lot of fun to uh, to really be in this restaurant um, atmosphere, and it made it um, and and then and then have um, you know members of our families play um, play some of the roles. <laughs> That's right. <laughs> My wife is still upset. She's been cut from this. Yes, she was cast as the rude woman. 
which I, I think that was her name, the rude the, woman. She was called the rude woman and she was <laughs> acquitted it absolutely brilliantly, very rudely. Uh, but we were running very long. Um, as, as you see, these episodes are quite lengthy. So we, we did have to make some hard choices. But um, also Sting uh, played ve- uh, plays Veiled Man um, and uh, Elliot Sumner um, plays the librarian. So I got a really uh, a big bang for my buck. <laughs> <laughs> I mean, you're mentioning there, Trudy, kind of like the length of the episodes. And one of the things that I love is, is if you look at the length, they're all ever so slightly different. You know, it's not formatted to each episode has to be exactly 20 minutes. So you're not constrained in that way. And I was interested in in your work with KB Miller and Teresa Tunney, who are the, the creators and writers and and what a lot of the development process looked like in really making sure that each episode kind of lived and breathed story wise in, in, in what it needed, both for that individual episode and for the overall narrative arc. Yes, I mean, the, it, it, it's a very un, it, it's very unusual, and, and, and all credit to Realm that um, Realm allowed us to divide the episodes up the way that they are written. And you know, we have some episodes as long as twenty seven minutes, and some as short as fourteen minutes. And um, and 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 some purchasers wouldn't be happy with that. They would ask you to like make everything. 15 or 20 or, or, or wherever. So I felt very, uh, very comforted by that because they, they have been written with great specificity and, uh, uh, and with a lot of thought. And, it, and you, you see there are many, many words um, that the, the actors had to get their, their, um, their, their lips around. And uh, with uh, Rebecca, um, English isn't her first language. She's, she's Swedish, although speaks beautifully um, the English language and with um, great, um, very, very enunciated. So um, I was worried that some of the episodes would actually sort of be hard on the listener, but um, I worked with a fantastic sound engineer called um, Gareth Fry, who um, who did encounters with Simon McBurney and um, yeah. works with uh, um, Nick Heitner um, nearly all the time. And he's got such a wonderful ear. And we worked uh, over a year, really, in getting the, the sound the way that we wanted. So to keep it sort of like really sizzling along. That's amazing. And and Mark, I wanted to ask you a little bit about developing a performance in this way that's leaning so solely into the vocal elements. And, and in particular, I was interested in whether you worked with Martin McKellen, who's a vocal coach that you've worked with on several projects over the years. Um, you know, if you worked with him directly on this or or another vocal coach or or what you've kind of taken from working specifically on dialect and, and vocal elements of performances in other projects that really came into fruition for something like this. Well, that's good research. How did you find out about my work with Martin McKellen? Internet, reading reading past interviews with both of you. Oh, right, right. Yeah, I have worked with Martin since um, I met him at Shakespeare's Globe and he was very helpful and has been ever since. Um, I don't know that, I can't remember now. I probably, probably most projects I do check in with him before, but um, I did, this didn't, in my memory, this didn't require uh, a, a kind of, the kind of dialect that that um, say Luca has asked for me for, in Bones and all, where he wants me to be a man from Georgia, or or in Don't Look Up, or these different films have have requirements that are different than the confused way that I speak myself. But th- this felt it. I think it, I was pretty close to my own voice in this, mm-hmm. in my memory of it. That that didn't seem that didn't seem to be the issue. It, this was more just that we she, truly rightly I think wanted Rebecca and I to really just be in the room without a technical challenge like that and speak using our own souls and our own voices to speak um yeah so I I I, I mean I I mean in terms of the vocal requirements of a pod, of a radio or podcast recording a non-visual recording Yes, I suppose the audience is very close to you. Uh, they, so, so that you can, you can be more magnetic with your voice. You don't have to be so electric or reaching out in the way you might in the theater. But, but re- re- really, um, really, it's all the same thing. It's all child's play. It's, it's really just still the same thing of looking in the eyes of the other person and trying to get what you want um, or need f- from them, uh, in this case, through speaking rather than 
dancing or pushing and pulling and moving around them. And it's a very static uh, drama, isn't it? There, it's a, it's basically a conversation over dinner with a lot of very dangerous and violent consequences poised around that that dinner. Mm -hmm. Absolutely. And, and Trudy, going back to, you know, you were mentioning Gareth Fry, who's the sound designer for this and, and working extensively over several months with him. And I, I was curious about how you kind of determined where you really wanted to add additional elements to the performances. You know, it's it's very deliberate in terms of where there's a sound effect, where we hear some of the cutlery rustling in the restaurant. Um, you know, music's use it, used in a very selective and specific way to enhance the story. And so how did you figure out where it was really going to enhance the storytelling and where you wanted to keep it a little bit quieter and a little bit more focused on the performance of the voice? As it was written, um, the whole thing was going to stay inside the, the restaurant. But um, I did think that over so many episodes, just staying in one location um, might not be as extraordinary as if we devised a, um, um, a method whereby uh, they took hands and um, Rebecca's character could um, upload all the experience that she had in Morocco or she had in Marseille. Um, and so she so effectively, she could take Mark's character with her. And so we could relive the experience of, say, the arc or the, you know, the, the scene with the uh, drunken American played by Fisher Stevens um, in, um, in the south of France, where he behaves very badly towards uh, her. And um, she just um, she quizzes him about um, about where the star constellations are. And at that moment that she looks him in the eye and he and hers and she she realizes that she loves him. She loves him just because of his fragility and his need to be rude is hiding who he really is. And there's this sort of very tender scene that is then seen by the maker who also has his own feelings of perhaps jealousy or perhaps uh, um, discomfort with uh, uh, being asked to witness it again. So, so all these um, elements were able to creep in uh, because we, we, the actors and, and, and me in the room said, okay, let's just go to Morocco. Let's just go to Marseille. Let's just go and look for the Ark um, in the High Atlas. And uh, with um, this, uh, and I asked to, um, to voice, um, because she's one of our great archaeologists in the world, Dame Mary Beard came on as okay. uh, as uh, uh, as the archaeologist. Um, so uh, really thinking through, all right, let's put them there. Let's just do it, and uh, and that I think added riches to the podcast. And for both of you, I wanted to ask about the way in which you wanted to approach this story as something that is about the, the center of emotion between these two characters at its core. But through that is having this very, you know, e eclectic discourse about a lot of themes and topics, you know, technology, relationships with that, how technology can be used nefariously in one way and used good in another space, depending on whose hands it's in. And so how did you really want to centralize this journey and this conversation between these two characters, but also have a much larger topic of discussion with the audience? I, just, I don't... Um... I don't really know the answer to that question. It's a good question. Um, I think that, I mean, the only thing I think is that the, the situation, the drop, the situation is what centralizes is in that the creator is facing a, a choice of whether to destroy this beautiful creation and, and step back that it's not worked or, 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 or whether actually the creation should be defended as the way forward. Um, and and that's a very that's a very wide uh, present conversation in the world, isn't it? In terms of where technology is leading us and and the harm that's being done, and yet also the potential good and the good that is being done through technology as well. And we, 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 as as the Dalai Lama said at one point, it comes to mind. You you know, it's, we don't lack information at the moment to to understand the problem. We lack heart and will to commit to uh, good and solutions and a, 
a collective we rather than a he, she, they, all that, but really this important step to we. And, and surprisingly in this podcast, the, the, uh, the creation is ahead of us uh, in that understanding. And we also, I think, get a, you know, a, a look into uh, humanity that uh, is, uh, you know, we're on the precipice, really, I think, of, um, of really destroying ourselves. Extinction, uh, yeah. Um, I think that that is very real. And in the stakeout uh, that's happening in the restaurant where they're being spied on, really, um, very, very closely. And each time Rebecca's character uh, expresses emotion or she starts to shake. Um, uh, and th there's this expression, oh, she's going random, you know, that human expression of, uh, of emotion, of sadness, uh, uh, because of the way she feels that she feels now as a singularity, but this pain that she feels is not acceptable. So take her out. Uh, and uh, I think this is the our writers uh, being just sort of like saying, you know, be very aware that uh, that when we when we think that it's okay to be emotional, we we all get emotional. But even now, Siri is listening to the timbre of my voice and we'll be I'll be sending three alerts of like how, how to get an SSRI pill for my depression or something <laughs> because there's now uh, you know algorithms are getting you know, you know it's smart uh, savvy but also maybe Machiavellian uh, that we are going to be sold stuff to even control our, our em emotions uh, yeah, did you see that there's a big thing, a thing you can wear at night that will stop nightmares now, like a kind of band around your head they've invented that stops nightmares. My God, that doesn't sound good. No, it's, we need it's, nightmares. Yeah. It's such an interesting exploration of, of topics in, in the series through that. And, you know, I was I was curious for both of you in in how you really found what you wanted, that specific emotion and that element of love between, you know, Mark's character and between the AI, her, to look like and, and kind of what you wanted her emotional landscape to be in response to that. You know, for him, this is something that he's really nurtured and grown and, and created. So it's not, you know, a typical romantic love, but there is this immense love that comes through in the conversation between the two of them as well. Yes, I mean, I described Spark Hunter as a love story as much as it's a st an AI story. I think it's a love story first. Yeah, and that particular love of fathers and daughters or parents and children is, is um, you know, is, is, yeah, it's one of the most profound loves you can, you can experience, isn't it? Yeah. Mm. It's, it, I like the fact that it's quite a challenge for listeners. It, it's very dense. It was a challenge to speak. But I was thinking that that's a really important element in terms of matching our imagination to the capability of a, of a very advanced robot, very advanced computer to talk and think about things. It, it would be false if it wasn't so dense. So you, you, you do need to put away the emails and listen to it like, a, like an immersive, dense piece of music. Definitely. And Trudy, did you and Rebecca talk all, talk at all about, okay, what are the parameters of this AI? What are the emotions that she feels? How does she feel them? And, and what does that sound like within the context of this series? Yes, we, we spent a lot of time um, talking um, about, you know, who, who, who is her? Who, who is she? Who is the bot? Um, and Rebecca is a very, um, very instinctive actress um and she she really brought uh just so so much passion and um dedication uh, and some of the uh, prose was is quite um quite wordy and and very intellectual and she's very smart so she doesn't have a problem with um with it being intellectual but be because it was so dense that we worked technically uh some of the time on just really getting to grips with um, making sure everybody understands the beats of all these episodes, where she is. And she, 
uh, Mark, Mark and she had a huge job. In fact, I think if I remember correctly, we only did it, uh, we only had five days to get through a Bible of, um, of, of, eight, of eight episodes. But uh, she, and then they were both kind enough to come back after I'd uh, worked with Gareth, Gareth uh, on the sound, and and then we'd noticed that there was some some pieces that were you know technically a little bit lost, or people outside because my whole family was there, sort of having rather a good time, and it was like, okay, we need to just clean the sound up anyway. So um, I don't know if I've answered your question properly, um, but Rebecca and I really talked on many levels of her experience of her love for her maker? Is it romantic and sexual love? Um, is it a, a father and daughter love? It's a, it was a very uh, um, complex relationship. It is a very complex relationship of this because we have to keep remembering that uh, she's playing the role of a bot who has who has reached singularity, who's gone over into having human emotions, but she remains an AI and the big revelation, well, I better not talk about the, um, the big revelation of, uh, of what he gives her right at the end that then really humanizes her. And in fact, after the shock of how could you have done that to me, what a betrayal that there's great relief that she can actually feel who she her, who she believes herself to be. In other words, a human. And and for you, Mark, as you were developing this character and reading through the scripts, you know, looking at this AI that he's created, how did kind of almost studying the character of her give you details of who he would be in terms of if this is what he's created, this is the, the moral code that he's created, this is ethically, you know, this is the personality and emotional space of this character. How did that really give you an insight into your own character by studying her? Well, I think you're right. You've answered your own question that, that, that you learn about him through the way she speaks because he's listening a lot of time and asking questions but it, it's it's her experiences and the way she she um, speaks about those experiences that obviously has come from him. I imagine with this kind of creation, uh, it's it's um, however much we might want to assign it to one genius, it's a collective thing, and many different people have contributed to it. But I suppose he's made crucial crucial genetic, so to speak, decisions about her character, and then she's grown. What you find out is she's grown beyond. He, he's not completely sure of what she's grown into, as you might not be with a child. Um, she she surprises him, and uh, that that's what he's certainly trying in my memory, trying to discern what have you become, my child, you, you know, and uh, where are you going, and what what um. Yeah, with all that, all the difficulty that you'd have talking with a real daughter or a real son about where they've got to, having have once they've gone out into the world and experienced all kinds of things privately. I think Yuval Harari, um, who wrote Sapiens, and he's also got a very good podcast, uh, Two Million Years in Two Hours, that um, he talks about, uh, um, you know, the, the, there's great optimism as far as Yuval's concerned with AI, that you can um, maybe, that we could evolve, evolve in a more, our most positive selves uh, could get a bot sidekick, almost like your own personal Jiminy Cricket. <laughs> and and uh, he or she or it bot would uh, live with you and um, would say, take a look in your fridge and, because this bot, your sidekick, would know absolutely everything about your human body and what would be what would optimize it. That you that there would be a, a, a great diet that would be, have you thought about this? Have you done that? And you know that's not to say that it should infantilize you, but but actually to be your sidekick, to be your to be your friend and to be your higher self when things are going rough in the human world. Now, I love this idea 
Uh, but of course, it comes. Do you? I don't like it at all. <laughs> you don't like it? No, I I don't even keep Siri on. I don't like being listened to. <laughs> but work on this. But okay. uh, but I I it's it's the the closest that I've come to sort of like thinking: Is there any merit in having? us human beings who are descending and need some help to uh, really put this planet right uh, because are we relying just on each other look at the leadership of the world because I don't think we can rely on each other we might need some great spiritual help maybe there'll be spirituality in our next set of robots Maybe uh, certainly the first robots are going to be fighters in wars, aren't they? That's where they are. That's where the advancements are being made, and that's where they're being used already um, to to uh, to fight wars and to dominate people. It all comes around. We've got to change ourselves, you know. I don't. I don't. It, it, it's it, at the moment. I wouldn't imagine they're going to be used for very good purposes. Um, but they can only be made as a reflection of ourselves. So that work would have yeah, to be done yeah. first. Yeah. yeah. I mean, I love the fact that after creating and, and working on a series like this together, that the two of you are still having these discourses around everything, which I think is a <laughs> testament. I think it's a testament to everything that the series itself is exploring. So congratulations on it. And thank you so much to both of you for talking about it. Really appreciate your time today. Thank you. Thank you, Maya. Thank you.